G'day everyone, I'm artist Wayne Dowson and welcome to my Anzac Portrait Series. Beside me is my portrait of 94 year old World War II veteran Bruce Robertson. Bruce began his military career with the Australian Militia, serving with the 30th Battalion New South Wales Scottish Regiment. Bruce then joined the Australian Air Force and became a wireless operator and served with the 30 Bowfighter Squadron. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy part two of our interview with Mr. Bruce Robertson. Trained as a wireless operator, came out and early 1942 was posted to Richmond. And believe it or not, I had been in the 30th Battalion Army. I was posted to number 30 Air Force Squadron and which was forming, didn't even have an aeroplane and uh, not for another month or so before we got aeroplanes and um, while we were there uh, not much to do and because we were ice operators we were trained to fly in a plane set up a signal station and do anything at all with wireless, Morse code included and in those days all orders Messages, communication was done by wireless, Morse code. And uh, no matter where it was around Australia, that's the way they communicated. And the signal station at Richmond, where all their normal wireless operators were, they, um, they were a bit short-handed, and while we were doing nothing, waiting for our aeroplanes and so on, to train with them, uh, we went and helped them out in the signal station. And on one occasion, I was on a midnight watch from uh, about 11 o'clock till 7 in the morning. And on this occasion, I was just searching on a radio receiver, listening out, turning the dial, just keep turning it around in case an aeroplane came up in trouble, just uh, so we'd know all about it. And on this occasion, this loud, loud Morse code hit me in the ears, uh, very loud it was, and I went to write it down. I couldn't write it down because it didn't make our letters. It was Morse code all right, but none of our letters were in it. So it hit me, it's got to be Japanese. So sure enough it was Japanese and everyone came running. I agreed that it was Japanese got to direction finding stations and they pinpointed the apex where the signal was coming from. Uh, we knew that it would be a, a Japanese submarine. Uh, there was a Lockheed Hudson bombed up, always on standby at Richmond. It went up looking for the sub, the Black Knight, Black Sub, they couldn't find it at all. It was right off Sydney Heads. It was the mother sub for the midget submarines coming into Sydney Harbour. So we had intercepted their communique, didn't know what they were talking about, but it came through my headphones in the Air Force, not the Army or the Navy or anyone else. And uh, that was quite an occasion that uh, we had listened to the enemy anyway, even though we didn't know what they were talking about. But that was for the midget subs. My squadron, 30 squadron, uh, the aeroplanes assigned to that squadron were bow fighters from England. We'd never heard of a bow fighter, but they were the most heavily armed fighter or plane in the war on any side. Had four cannons and six machine guns, and later on in the war they had eight rockets as well, which was a tremendous firepower. So our boys trained on the bow fighters and we marched out of Richmond, the squadron, to Clarendon Railway Station, which is right at the Richmond Aerodrome, and uh, got into our train, about four, four carriages, and uh, about 250 of us all told, uh, got into the carriages, and we also had goods trucks with our equipment on as well. Uh, set off from there, we marched out of Richmond, all the, the Air Force personnel there would have been about five or six thousand there. They lined the streets and gave us a wave off. We were in summer gear and it was the middle of winter. And when we marched out we had rifles and bayonets and water bottles and webbing with cartridges in them as they were soldiers. And uh, 
down onto the train. Uh, the Air Force Band played a tune called Goodbye. It was from a, from a stage show called The White Horse Inn. And uh, so everyone waved us goodbye <laughs> and off we went. We thought we were going to Central Station. That's where all the, uh, all the um, troop trains left from Central Station. And we thought we were going to Central. But there, unbeknownst to anybody, there's a little branch line outside Strathville Station which curves around to go up north and um, over the Hawke's been up to Brisbane that way. So we sat on this little branch line for about four hours or more and just, just the train sitting there. And then um, my fiance, Beryl, I got word to her we were leaving and she went into Central Station waiting for the uh, trip train to come and her sister went with her and they were there all day waiting for this troop train which never arrived of course and um, but one of the squadron boys his mother had gone to Strathfield station and spoke to the station master and said what time is the troop train coming from Richmond he said it's not coming in here it's not going to central it said on that branch line there he told her how to walk out on the train lines with safety, how to get to the train, and she did. Everybody on the train wrote a letter and gave her the money for the stamp, so she was loaded up with tuppence for a stamp and, uh, and all these letters to post. So uh, that was our leaving Sydney time. We went, uh, the train left and went north up through Brooklyn and the Hawkesbury River. Now the railway bridge over the Hawkesbury River the pile, it, when it was built, they said that that was the deepest river in the world. They had to go down so far through the mud to get some rock at the bottom to build the pylons. But uh, they had moved and there were cracks in the bridge. So the train, which was a steam engine and all the carriages, all the trains, were limited to four miles an hour. Now that's about um, five and a half kilometres an hour to go over that bridge. And you could stand out on the platform with a carriage and look down and see the bridge and all the jellyfish and things in the water, but the train just gradually moving across that bridge. That was the only way to get north, there was no other way. So um, it took us two days to get to Brisbane. So to, you'd laugh at that today. But we got to one place in the morning after leaving Richmond I've been on the train all night, just straw seats to sit on, very old carriages. Uh, you could sit down and couldn't lie down and be hard to sleep. We got to this town and uh, we were going to be there for a couple of hours, so we went into the town to buy some Johnson's baby powder. We were all going north, we knew that. So that was to put under our arms and prevent tinea in our toes and things like that. We went into the chemist and and believe it or not, in those days, those early days, there were no names on any railway stations. So unless you knew a station or an area, you didn't know where you were. All the names were taken off railway stations. That was precaution in case there had, was an invasion from Japan. And uh, they didn't want them, to, authorities didn't want them to know where they were at all at any time. So we didn't know where we were in this railway station in the country. Went into the chemist shop and said, uh, where are we? He said, it's Kempsey. You're in Kempsey. <laughs> and that's where we knew. We had our photos taken there with holding up our tins of Johnson's baby powder uh, with wireless fellas and so on. And of course, when you did a course in the Air Force, you usually stuck with that group of fellas that did the same thing as you. But then, when there's only a couple of hundred, 250 together, you'd get to know everybody pretty well. So, uh, off we went to Brisbane, stayed in an American staging camp there with American tents. Americans were in the war then. Americans were all over the place. And uh, they had lots of money, dollars coming out of their ears. And the girls flocked to them. Beautifully dressed, lovely shirt and trousers and a tie. And, um, and uh, anyway, um, 
We travelled from Brisbane to Townsville, had a month in Townsville, climatising to the tropics and getting used to that sort of weather. And went from there, I flew to uh, Moresby. Others in the squadron went by ship with all our equipment. We had an advance party at Port Moresby who set up our tents and so and so it was ready for us to go in. There were no showers, uh, nothing uh, to um, uh, the ordinary like, way of life. We were really roughing it and uh, later on um, some one of our uh, squadron could divine water. He was a water diviner. So he walked around with a piece of wire in his hand and the wire went haywire over a certain spot and he said, there's water down there. And they dug down and there was water there. So they sank this um, a well and, um, and uh, we had um, piping and shower heads to put up showers. And so they were rigged up over that water and they were our showers from then on, never without water. But that was in the early days of the camp. When we arrived at uh, Moresby, there was um, uh, the main aerodrome or flying strip was called Jackson Field or the Seven Mile. It was known as the Seven Mile. It was quite big. When we arrived, all bailed out onto a truck, an American Negro, Negro driving the truck. And off we go, heading for Ward's Strip, which was a brand new aerodrome, uh, a landing place for our planes. Never been used, hadn't even had a plane land on it. It was built and we were first to go onto that. But as we're driving along in this truck, we're passing a hill, not terribly high, but very, very steep. And uh, the truck stopped, suddenly braked, the driver got out and ran up this hill. He clambered up the hill. He couldn't run up the hill. You were almost on lying down on it, scrambling up this hill. And we were all laughing at him because it was, it was just hilarious to see a fellow stop the truck and run up the hill. We were all laden up with all our gear packs and uh, rifles and all the rest of things. Tin hat, the works. And uh, he turned around halfway up the hill and he said, uh, you wouldn't be laughing if you knew it was an air raid. <laughs> well, zoom out of that truck. This was our first blood in New Guinea. And of course, uh, shortly after we moved to Wood Strip, the rest of the squadron arrived with all our equipment. We had trucks and all, everything that was needed to maintain an aeroplane, to service an aeroplane, to put a new engine in and all our equipment and stores, that all came with us. And in, in the working of a, an airstrip, you've got aeroplanes, you've got people that fly them, you've got people that have got to get them in the air to make them fly. And things will happen to them, they have to be repaired and serviced, just like a motor car, a plane has to do this. It might be bombed and damaged. You've got people who look after the fuselage and the wings and the body of the plane and you've got people who look after the engines and the people look after the electrical side. The people look after the armaments, all the firing parts. So there are various groups in your unit. You've got your wireless part who have the communication with everyone and everything. An aeroplane, if something's wrong, they hear it and know about it. And, uh, and so on. And then there's the administrative part, the office of the... Uh, and the office was run by an adjutant and he had staff under him, clerks and so on, to look after things. The commanding officer, he was in charge of everything overall. He was also a pilot, and the first um, uh, commanding officer we had in New Guinea was uh, Brian Walker, the wing commander, known not as Brian Walker, but Blackjack Walker. That was his name, and he was known throughout the Air Force as Blackjack Walker. Uh, a wonderful flyer. There wouldn't have been a better flyer in the Air Force than Blackjack Walker. Um, hard taskmaker, he knew everything about aeroplanes, and he'd quiz his air crews and so on about all sorts of things t to see if they knew what he, what he knew and teach them various things. Um, our first aeroplanes arrived and then the whole squadron was there in one piece. Um, 
it was um, early days for everything, but uh, first strike came when the if planes go out. It's called a strike. They went out on their first strike, which was over towards Boona, the far side of New Guinea, a long flying trip. Bow, bow fighters could fly long distances. Uh, they were a good fast aeroplane, no match for a zero uh, or an enemy fighter up in the sky, high up. But at sea level, nothing could catch them. They could draw away from any plane in the world at sea level. Uh, they had that wonderful power. And they normally flew at treetop height. The height of a big tall gum tree, that's the height of a bow fighter. And they flew that way. I've been in bow fighters flying along uh, in a waterfront and just skimming along the waves and come to the headland and just go up over the headland and down again the other side. Uh, I've even flown over native canoes, um, outrigger canoes, um, and the natives have jived overboard. You can see them quite plainly. We're flying so low. And, and that was normal for a bow fighter. That wasn't abnormal. Other planes, that would be abnormal, but a bow fighter flew at that height and you couldn't hear them. They were, um, they were, uh, had uh, engines, Hercules engines, which had sleeve valves, and you couldn't hear them coming. It's strange to say that, but nothing like today. If there was one today flying, you wouldn't hear it. And uh, they talk about American stealth aircraft, but bow fighters were that way, and the Japanese called them whispering death because they were on them before the chaps knew they were coming. And um, so much for the aircraft, which was wonderful. It had this marvellous firepower. Our first uh, sortie was at um, Boona, and believe it or not, we lost an aircraft and, and a, couple of, a couple of our mates died. Um, but that was our first blooding into wartime, and uh, we'd lost some of our unit and that brought the reality of war home to us. Those fellows weren't there anymore. And that happened over the years there. Um, somebody goes out, a, a mate of mine, I'm jumping ahead perhaps a little, a mate of mine sitting on uh, my bed, he had a portable gramophone, just a small one, you wind the handle, had two records of Bing Crosby singing, who was the popular singer at that day. and. Uh, he said, well, I'm off now, I've got to get up early in the morning. We're off early. Well, that's OK. But he didn't come back. He's gone. You'll never see him again. Disappeared. In my tent is his gramophone that he brought over and left there for us to play until he came again. And here's that. And that brings the stark reality on what can happen and so on. So I did have a crash in a bow fighter, um, smashed the undercart off and we were landing and finished up in a dry dry creek, there was no water in it. There were trees either side and we picked the spot where there were no trees and the wings are stuck on the sides of the creek and the propellers bent up, quite a wreck. It got out safely, no trouble, so that's, uh, it was just another incident and in things going along. One occasion, uh, there was a big scream in our tent in the middle of the night, a real enormous scream. One of the fellows screamed. He'd been bitten by something. So we got him out, one of the boys took him up to the doctor's tent, this is the middle of the night. And uh, we searched his cot, couldn't, and we slept on, a, on a, a hessian bag, like a big chaff bag, called, and uh, filled with straw, he filled up with straw. That was your mattress. It was called a pallias. So you, you slept on this pallias. And we stripped his bed down, couldn't find anything. Then we tipped the straw out from inside. He was a centipede, nearly about a foot long, I think. And this had bitten him. And uh, it must have been in his bed all the time. <coughs> and he recovered okay. But uh, it woke everyone up around the place. Things like that happen from time to time. So if, while we were in uh, New Guinea, we had to learn to, uh, we wireless operators had to learn to ride a motorbike. 
We had two or three motorbikes in the unit. And after falling off a few times, the uh, transport sergeant said, no, you're okay, everyone, you, you're okay. You can ride the bike whenever you want to. So we'd ride it into Port Moresby or some other place at a different time. I was coming back, when I'd been to Port Moresby, coming back daytime and riding up alongside the airstrip. Now, there were no buildings at all, no buildings there at all, it was all tents. And uh, just a, a track, it was really a track, but the Americans had graders and uh, bulldozers and things, and they bulldozed this into a semi-road, semi just dirt. And as I came along, uh, there were no trees in sight, it was just flat country. I could see a mile. And the, um, here was this grader, and as I got closer, I could hear it over the, even the noise of the motorbike, the engine was still running in it and there was no one in it. It was empty. So, I switched my engine on and I heard this voice saying, have they gone yet? Have they gone? Have they gone yet? And uh, I looked around, I couldn't see anyone anywhere. And then to make a drone under a road, they knocked the ends out of 44 gallon drums, petrol drums, and put them together and um, and that made a drain under a big culvert under there and put them in. And here was this American Negro driving the tractor. He was the track the uh, grader driver, and um, he was in this drain. He thought there was an air raid on. I was oblivious to anything, and he was he was scared stiff of you know just what was what. So he made for the best shelter he could find, and that was in the drain under the road. <laughs> Another occasion I'd been to Moresby and I came back at night time, pitched up, only the headlight of the old Indian motorbike, it was an Indian, and uh, I turned down alongside the strip as I thought, but I found that I was driving down the middle of the airstrip. Now, that's okay, I couldn't have got hurt, only that we had guards all the way down that strip in different places, and they just opened fire on you. So I about turned, as soon as I realised, about turned and got back up onto the track at the end and down the side of the street. That was a close call for things. <laughs> <laughs> From Boona to Gona to San Ananda, three places on the coast. And that's where the Japs were landing there, on barges from their troop ships, landing thousands of troops. They, they were all massing there. They had lay up further, which was a huge base full of Japanese troops. And the thing was, if they too amalgamated, there was no, no way we could have stopped them coming. Our troops were exhausted after Kokoda. We didn't have the numbers. America was occupied with other Pacific Islands, so we didn't have, couldn't rely on them for help. So had those two amalgamated, they would have come straight through. There was no stopping them. So they had to be stopped. This is where the bow fighters came in again. The, um, they attacked the barges landing troops ashore and supplies uh, with success. And then the army would call them in uh, with a smoke signal where there was a pocket of Japanese and uh, they'd shoot up that whole area with their four cannons and six machine guns. Imagine, imagine the destruction. Army went in after and found six, in one particular place, 600 Japanese had been killed in one go after a strike by the bow fighters. So the, the Army and the Air Force worked together wonderfully there. That was the second big battle and the Australians won that battle. Um, purely Australian battle, Army and Air Force. And uh, the Japanese still were at Leh and Madang, they had those places. Lay was a huge base. Then we come to the um, the final big battle. It was uh, in Rabaul. Uh, our intelligence we had wireless spotters in all these islands and so on, 
hidden in the jungle. It would radio back to Port Moresby about aircraft or shipping movements. And a big, a big convoy was being assembled at Rabaul in the, on the island of New Britain, north of New Guinea. And um, there were troop ships and warships. And they just set off, had, had news that they had left heading for, we presumed to be Ley, and it was Ley, they were heading for. And the, uh, we had reconnaissance aeroplanes, <coughs> and Australian Catalina flying boat, he shadowed this fleet. And, uh, but the weather was terrible, the Catalina dropped odd bombs to uh, let, let the fleet know that they'd been discovered anyway. And for two days it rained. We tried to get to them at fortresses, flying fortresses, Americans, Australian Beaufort bombers from Milne Bay with torpedoes, tried to find them. Two aircraft did find them and, and uh, couldn't attack, the weather was so bad, but they did fire their machine guns at them, doing no damage. Apparently, but anyway, the, the convoy of um, sixteen ships, um, eight, I think there were eight warships and eight troop carriers, full of just seven thousand four hundred troops, and uh, all their equipment and supplies, all they needed, and they were heading for Ley. Two days had gone past, and the weather was bad. The next day, the end of the next day, they would land at Ley. Well, the next day happened to be a fine day. In the meantime, an Australian, Bill Gehring, uh, he put forward a plan to the Americans. It went to General MacArthur, who okayed it, and said, OK, put your plan into operation. Now, his plan was to attack the, um, all the shipping with the bow fighters who flew so low to destroy the bridges and the um, anti-aircraft guns on all the ships. Up above them, flying you know, slightly higher, were B-25 American bombers with skip bombs, where they dropped in the water and the bomb went through into the ship. Then they had other bombers again to drop bombs, and the next lot liberators, and then finally uh, flying fortresses on top to do the final bombings. Now, they carried out a practice run at a, at a place called Cape Ward Hunt and sorted out all the cobwebs that had gone wrong in that and came for that very day when they had to operate. The bow fighters left Moresby. I was a wireless operator, I was the communication to them and um, they went to Cape Ward Hunt they were the low ones, the lowest on the tier. 150 aeroplanes in a spiral right up into the sky, one layer upon layer, with the fortresses on top. Well, away went the bow fighters, flying um, uh, close formation, and then when they sighted the uh, Japanese fleet, they spread to line abreast one alongside the other, a big line of bow fighters. The Japanese, and they're flying low, just over the water, the Japanese captains thought that uh, they were going to drop for torpedoes, thought they were torpedo bombers. So they turned the ships from broadside to head on to the bow fighters, which was just what they wanted, to strafe the bridges and the superstructure and the anti-aircraft guns. They went in and did that and destroyed every one of them. The, uh, in, in Japanese uh, system, the captain of the ship, if he's killed, no one else can run the ship. He was the captain and they don't recognise anyone else. So they destroyed all the captains, destroyed all the superstructure and the anti-aircraft guns. They were sitting ducks. They couldn't do anything with the ships. Uh, so the bombers then came in, skip bombed them. Um, dropped their bombs and, and destroyed them. So they sank, uh, all told, overall, 12 of the transports. Destroyers got away and rescued a few 
sailors who were in the water, but a complete annihilation. Uh, they didn't get to lay, so that meant that uh, it was a great win for, uh, for the Allies, which was Australia was part of that. It saved Australia, because had they landed, they'd have been right into Australia. There's nothing to stop them. Believe it or not, that battle was won. Now, not all the ships were sunk by that time, but the battle was won in 28 minutes, which is phenomenal. You can't believe it. And uh, Bill Gang had been very, I was very friendly with him, and he spoke of several of our doings later on, and just said, it only took 28 minutes, and they were destroyed. And the bombers just came and just bombed them out of the water. So, uh, both fighters played the initial part and the most crucial part in that battle, which was a great accolade for Australia. On coming back to Australia after my New Guinea tour, I offloaded at Townsville, went up to Cairns and served with the Flying Boat Squadron for a couple of months. Beryl, my fiance, was waiting for me when I arrived home and uh, she had everything prepared for our wedding. And we were married very quickly. Wonderful friends and guests, 80 people. It was a lovely time. And uh, my fiancée was now my wife. Most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. And I loved her all my life. And at the end of that few days, I was off to Darwin again. The Air Force were not a bit considerate. They didn't care whether I went to Darwin or not or where I was. But that's where I finished up going to Darwin. We never ever had a honeymoon, but we had a fantastic life, absolutely.